Get ready to rumble. Chilling Show Unleashed on the Seven Thunders Media Network. Former city councilor, husband, father, and community watchdog. Your host, Rob Schilling. Welcome to the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Remember, your direct support makes our show possible, and you can directly support this podcast by visiting shillingshow.com and then clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page to make a monthly contribution. We appreciate your support. I wanted to spend some time talking about socialism and the problem of socialism in today's society. You know, as I think about my own upbringing, it was not talked about enough didn't hear about it in school hardly at all. I'm talking about going all the way K through 12 and then up into college in my four years of college. I heard almost nothing about socialism. Well, we trusted our leaders. We heard about it politically. We thought it was well in hand that people were aware of the threat, but that it was a threat over there. It was not a threat domestically. People weren't really talking about it. There were a lot of people then who loved America because we were taught patriotism in schools. We were taught to love and respect our country, and people took for granted that everybody or most everybody was doing that. As I came into politics here in Virginia, serving as a member of the Charlottesville City Council, It was interesting how I started to see socialism creeping into government with this constant call of raising someone's taxes to pay for something for somebody else. A lot of this had to do with affordable housing. Even back then, it was an issue. And so people thought the taxes were too high in Charlottesville. What was the solution? Well, let's raise taxes on everybody who's already here. All the people who are in Charlottesville who've afforded a house already, let's increase their taxes to create a fund to diminish the cost of housing for other people who don't live here or don't own a home here yet. Even people from outside of this country who are coming to Charlottesville. What a country, as Yakov Smirnov used to say. We'll just take from those who have been successful here, who have scrimped and saved, as they used to say, people who have worked very hard to accomplish something. We'll just take from them and give to somebody else because it's their time to get on the gravy train. I remember watching the occupiers take over of Lee Park during the Occupy movement. If ever there was socialism, that was it. If ever there was a mob or the beginnings of the manifestation of a mob in Charlottesville, that was it. And so these socialists decided that uh, they were the 99%. They just came up with that number. And they wanted to take things from the 1%. They wanted to soak the rich. They wanted to steal and pillage so that they could have a better life. They were too damn lazy to work for it themselves. They were not intelligent enough to understand that the mob always ends badly. And so for 30 days, they sat in Lee Park in defiance of the law, enabled by the weak and spineless, overpaid and underqualified city manager, Maurice Jones, who's now uh, doing his thing in North Carolina, (laughs) ruining some other community, but uh, also enabled by the mayor of this community at the time, Dave Norris. Norris the Red, as we called him at that time. And Norris the Red tried to buddy up to the socialists, to the anarchists over in Lee Park, who wouldn't leave when they were told to, who were violating laws and given permission to violate the law by the government, by the city council, by the city manager. It did not end well for Dave Norris and the mob, as always happens with the mob, On the night that the anarchists, the occupiers, were evicted from Lee Park, the government had finally had enough and realized the fact that, hey, there's so many violations going here in this socialist utopia. They're cooking food and having open fires against state laws. Oh, they even had rape whistles distributed here because in this peaceful, loving enclave of socialists, there were sexual assaults going on nightly. And so they decided finally to call the police in. Well, on that night, the occupiers got word of it and the chant of F. Dave Norris, I won't use the real word, F. Dave Norris, F. Dave Norris, the angry chants and the burning of Norris the Red in flames of red as he was burned in effigy at Lee Park. This is socialism in action. You see the useful idiots, they will be used while they are useful 
and then they will be disposed of. It's happened throughout history. It happened here in Lee Park with Dave Norris. Of course, we've had over the years a number of these incidents of socialism documented in our local schools. It wasn't long ago at Woodbrook School, and Woodbrook isn't the only one. It was a number of schools in Albemarle County and probably in Charlottesville and maybe beyond as well. That the list went out for school supplies, this is when we actually had school, they sent it home to the parents and said, here are the things that your children need to bring to school with them. Now, back in the day, uh, all the taxes that were being paid People counted on the schools to provide these things. These days, at least last year and previous years, they required students to bring their own supplies. So you bring things like crayons and wipes and Kleenexes, pencils and pens and paper, and other things that were important to have in school. And at the very top of the page were words to the effect of, we don't write our names on anything. We don't write our names on anything because this all goes into a communal pot. And for those people who just choose to freeload, who don't choose to bring the supplies along, they'll just get to take a piece of yours. Now, they don't say that, but that's exactly what's going on because everything goes into one big pot when you get in the classroom. Nothing's mine. Nothing's yours. Everything belongs to everybody. What a recipe for disaster and what a horrible lesson to be teaching young people. I think about a book, The Jamestown Experiment. I had the author on early on in the days of The Shilling Show, and we talked about what happened in Jamestown, something not taught in schools. But they came here and they said the same thing in essence. We'll work. We'll all work together. We'll all put it in a communal pot. At the end of the day, we'll all share and everything will be wonderful in Jamestown. Well, they almost starved to death. Their miserable experiment in socialism failed because one by one, or maybe two by two, people realized if we don't work, we can eat anyway. If we don't work, we can be housed anyway. Why would I carry your water when you'll carry mine? And the whole thing almost went down until they realized they need to restructure things. And that's the way it is with socialism. We just haven't realized it yet in America, but it's exactly what's coming to us. Socialism also comes with death in many ways, as we've seen over the years. Anyone who's studied history knows about the death that follows socialism. There are so many ways that this happens, and it can be direct. I mean, they do kill people. They do cut their heads off when they no longer are useful to the cause. But it also comes in the form of just the deprivation of people from things that they need. And so when we have socialized medicine, people are not able to get the sort of care they had in a capitalist society. Obviously, they end up dying on a waiting list somewhere, waiting for an appendix to be removed. Oh, we can get to you uh, December the 3rd, and well, they're long gone by the time that rolls around. These sorts of things happen. It's a loss of choice that many in socialist nations have recognized and probably after a while have just forgotten. You know, when you walk into a store in a socialist nation, you're not going to see that whole aisle dedicated to cereal choices or soda pop choices or any other choices. All those cuts of meat? Nope. It's Friday. Maybe you'll get a little bit of ground beef thrown out on the table and you better be satisfied with it. Maybe they'll have Cheerios or some sort of oat circles for cereal and that's what you get this week because that's what they have. You want to have cutting edge innovation. You want to have a new iPhone every year. You want to have a new version of the software and new apps. It doesn't happen often in socialist nations. You notice in places like China, they're constantly stealing from the innovators in the West, in particular the United States of America, whether it's through extortion by gaining access to their markets or whether it's through direct espionage of our trade secrets. The Chinese don't innovate as much as they steal and then replicate. This is socialism. And if you want to have a poor lifestyle, you can enjoy socialism. After traveling in Europe some decades ago and seeing what it was like then in these countries that were starting to embrace socialism and now are fully in the throes of it, you could tell not only the selections in the supermarkets, as I referenced, but also the standard of living. We went into some of the apartments and everything is small. The kitchens are small. The living rooms are small. The bedrooms are tiny. We have it so good here. And it is not because of socialism. It's exactly the opposite. It's because of capitalism that we enjoy such a wonderful lifestyle. I remember talking to a friend many years ago who had spent considerable time in Europe and was talking to me about socialism. The socialist takeover of the churches even where churches were taxed and very few people went anymore. 
But he was telling me about the dour looks on the faces of people walking down the streets in these socialist nations at that time in Eastern Europe, where people had nothing to be happy about. And you could see the poor state of things reflected in the faces of those who were subject to socialist dictatorships and socialist governments, even quote-unquote democratic socialism. Of course, there's no such thing. It's just a milder form of where it's going down the line, which is total despotism. So in a socialist country, in a socialist society, you and I would have no identity or very little identity as individuals. We would have mostly identity as part of a group. There would be collectivism. There would be the commons, as was talked about when Dave Norris was elected or selected to be mayor of the city of Charlottesville gushing eloquently about the commons and how wonderful it was, never realizing that in the commons of Lee Park, he would be burned in effigy a few years later. Just remarkable how foolish people embrace ridiculous ideas because they don't know their history and they don't know where these things go. The Schilling Show Unleashed continues in just a moment. Join the revolution online at shillingshow.com. Borderhawk.news is a one-stop shop with the latest news about immigration, nationalism, and globalism. The Borderhawk staff daily curates immigration news stories and in the fashion of the Drudge Report, updates the site with cutting-edge content and original first-class commentary. Borderhawk.news highlights national and international media reports, tweets, and nuggets buried in local news blurbs, polls, video clips, and policy research. Borderhawk is pro-legal immigration, pro-rule of law, but against an unsecure border as countless Americans have suffered violence at the hands of criminal illegal aliens. And an increasing number of Americans are concerned about how mass migration affects their daily life. Borderhawk.news will remain on the forefront of the immigration issue with a buffet of info to read, evaluate, and share. Bookmark Borderhawk.news. Add them on social media at Borderhawk News on Twitter. Looking out for us, Rob Schaub. Ian Murray is the director for the Center for Economic Freedom at the Competitive Enterprise Institute and author of the brand new book, The Socialist Temptation. And it's such a timely book and so important for us to be looking at this right now where we are in the throes of what appears to be a socialist revolution. I think a lot of this comes back to this myth of Scandinavian socialism and why it's perpetuated. What do you think, Ian? Yes, it, it, it is astonishing that people don't ne- never actually go out and take a look at, at what Sweden is actually like, nor do they actually listen to Swedes. If you talk to Swedes, they, 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 they're just nonplussed that their uh, com- country is being held up as uh, an example of socialism because they actually rejected socialism explicitly in the 1970s. Uh, they had a socialist state. They turned around. They said, no, we don't want, the, want that. It's, it, it's dreary. It's depressing. It's uh, really causing uh, severe economic problems. We can't have a socialist state. And so they rejected it. And uh, it, uh, and you'd think that that had never happened from listening to people like uh, like uh, Bernie Sanders or AOC. Ian Murray, uh, the progressive movement and our history with socialism, you spend a lot of time in the book, The Socialist Temptation, and it's well spent because we don't know our own history. But uh, this was really the genesis of a lot of our problems today. Well, indeed, uh, the progressive movement... Uh, uh, which uh, happened at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the, uh, of the 20th, uh, really uh, started to rewrite uh, the American Constitution. Uh, they passed a series of statutes which are still with us today and which the, um, uh, the Supreme Court and Congress really treat as, as if they were super statutes, uh, is the term uh, I employ, uh, that, that, that are essentially part of the Constitution. Uh, and these statutes have set up the uh, the administrative state. You know, the, the, um, we talk about the alphabet soup of agencies that the New Deal brought to us, but uh, a lot of the of the agencies uh, that were set up um, were, were set up in the Progressive Era uh, to uh, to control and direct uh, private industry, the economy, and how we as citizens. Uh, re- relate to it. And that has formed the basis of this fourth branch of government, which would be the vehicle for delivering socialism. 
So, Ian, how was the American public sold on this as we look back at the successes of the progressive era? Uh, well, the, the, uh, the, 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 the progressives did a very good job of turning around to, uh, to, to Americans and saying, there's something not right. And they were helped by, uh, by, by, by the, the writers of polemics like uh, Upton Sinclair, uh, you know, the, who wrote The Jungle and said that there are terrible things happening in the, in, in the meatpacking industry. There, there, there almost certainly were. But if you look at the history of uh, industrial injustices, generally speaking, the, um, uh, the, the industry uh, has almost always cleaned up its act by the time that Congress gets round to uh, gets round to acting, uh, that's certainly the case with child labour and uh, ridiculously lengthy working hours, all, all those sort of things. Uh, industry had cleaned up its act by the time the Congress came in and put in place uh, legislation uh, to say that you must do things that industry was already doing. So industry was almost certainly in the in, in the process of cleaning up its act. But they wanted to go, so they wanted to go further than just uh, rubber stamping something industry had already done. They want uh, they wanted to, uh, to to put this layer of control over industry, so so that whatever they uh, the, they the bureaucrats wanted to do, industry would uh, would, would have to follow. And so, so they used justifiable concern. They spoke to basic American values like fairness, uh, freedom, and equality, uh, and uh, that's. Uh, that, that, that's how they did it. You know, Ian, one of, I think, the biggest disasters of the progressive movement was the 17th Amendment, the direct election of senators, as opposed to our federalist system. And I'm wondering if you make any connection between the 17th Amendment and socialism in America today. Well, uh, the 17th Amendment uh, 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 is a good example of how more democracy does not equal uh, a, a better system. Uh, you talk to, to socialists and they say, we are democratic socialists. They, they, they use that to distinguish themselves from revolutionary socialists, uh, uh, you know, like Karl Marx and, uh, and, and Vladimir Lenin and so on, they, they, and Mao. Uh, they were revolutionaries. They, uh, and people are scared of revolution for, 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 for obvious reasons. So they say, no, no, we're democratic socialists. And then they t uh, take it further and say that uh, you can't object to democratic control o over things. But as you say, the 17th Amendment is, is a great example of how uh, more democracy does not necessarily equal uh, a better system of government. It, uh, it, it significantly reduced the impact of federalism on uh, on American society and brought, took us uh, away from being uh, a republic as we had been set up to be, and more towards uh, a democracy that can be demagogued. Indeed, we're talking with Ian Murray. The new book is *The Socialist Temptation*. It is really well done, an easy read, but very substantive. I want to go into these polls, which I find absolutely frightening. We've been hearing them on and off over the past year or so about how Americans, and particularly young people, view socialism. Well, yes. The, um, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was, uh, in The Socialist Temptation was, was to get look at the polling data and, uh, and, uh, and see, is, is this all overblown? Uh, do um, uh, our Americans actually really uh, quite blasé about, uh, about socialism? When you look at the polling data, um, socialism, uh, there's a very clear generational divide. Uh, baby boomers and Generation X, my generation, uh, are very skeptical of socialism. Uh, that, so that, that skepticism breaks down with the millennial generation and is almost entirely gone by the time you get to uh, the, the new generation, Generation Z. Um, it, 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 there's also a divide between um, uh, socialism itself as an ideology and socialist policies. So avowedly socialist policies like uh, universal, health, so, universal socialized health care and so on are even more popular than socialism, uh, the ideology, uh, among the, 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 those young people. So I think we have to start asking you know, how, why is there such a generational divide? 
Ian, you talk uh, quite a bit about this in the book uh, because we've got issues in our campuses, our college campuses right here in Central Virginia at the University of Virginia, and also in our elementary schools on up to high school. The K-12 system is indoctrinating students uh, almost thoroughly in the benefits of socialism. I want to bring a case in point here. In uh, our local elementary school here in this neighborhood, at the beginning of the year, they instruct everyone to bring in all of these school supplies. And then they say, we don't put our name on anything. This all goes into a communal pot. Well, indeed, this this is uh, an example of of what I talk about in the book when I say that uh, that that that, uh, socialists are uh, speaking to and exploiting uh, some fundamental American values. Uh, We all teach our children uh, at uh, at one level level or another to share and not be selfish. But when you institutionalize it that way, that you have to share. Uh, and uh, share, uh, share in a way such that you have no, uh, 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 you essentially have no property right over the uh, the things that you bring uh, bring to school. Then you are indeed starting to uh, indoctrinate uh, people, uh, very young children, into the idea that they have no right to the things that they bring to the table. Uh, sharing should be voluntary we make it compulsory, and that's a big shift. So what is it we should be doing about this problem of the schools, uh, both K-12 and university? Because this is really what's, I think, tilting us far to the left and this embrace of socialism. Well, I think uh, that that, uh, those of us uh, who are paying for uh, uh, school and college education we do have uh, something which, uh, you know, in congressional terms, is called the power of the purse. We can say that no, we're not going to pay for our uh, for, for our children to be indoctrinated this way. You know, we, we can show up at school board meetings and uh, and, uh, and 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 complain, and even more so uh, at, at universities. And at universities, it's where socialism itself uh, uh, is is promoted. Um, in the in the socialist temptation, I talk about uh, the research of my friend Phil Magnus, who has found that the second most prescribed text in all of college syllabuses across America is Karl Marx's uh, "The Communist Manifesto," mm. and the Communist Manifesto is being pres- uh, is, is, is being pres- uh, uh, prescribed reading uh, for not economics, uh, 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 not for the economics discipline. But for things like uh, like history, for things like English, for any of the classes that have studies after their name, and we have to uh, we, we we have to take a look at uh, the syllabuses that our children are, are are studying. And if we see the Communist Manifesto on there uh, without something uh, something balancing it, I think we have uh, we we have to use that power of the purse and say no, we're not sending our child to the to to, to this institution. Ian Murray is our guest. The book is The Socialist Temptation. So, Ian, in the book, you talk about uh, socialism and equality, and then I want to get into also the problem of inequality under a capitalist system, because for some reason, we have now become intolerant to that. Well, indeed. Um, This is uh, 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 one of the tricks that socialism uh, plays on us. As I say, socialism does a very good job of speaking to a fundamental American value, which is equality. No American believes that uh, anybody should get a leg up on their fellow Americans uh, because of uh, an accident of birth. Uh, It's one of the fundamental principles of the American founding. Uh, That's why we have no aristocracy in, in America. However, that is about equality of outcome. Everybody, uh, sorry, equality of opportunity. Everybody gets uh, a good, op- uh, an equal opportunity to uh, do well for themselves. Uh, socialists uh, instead uh, shift this to equality of outcome. That there should not, that we must not tolerate any difference in outcome uh, beyond, uh, beyond beyond a small variance uh, uh, for, uh, for for how people uh, are. Uh, that, uh, how people's uh, economic situation uh, ends up. So it's all about a shift from equality of opportunity to equality of outcome, or as they, they've started calling it, 
equity. Yes, we're hearing a lot about equity here in Charlottesville. Ian Murray, so let's draw a direct line to how that policy of uh, seeking equality or equity actually harms us as a nation, because a lot of people would look at it and say, well, that's great. We'll all be equal and uh, that'll be fine for everybody. Well, one of the, the, the problems with equity is that it's not so much, um, uh, it, it, in practice, it's not so much a leveling up, as the socialists tell you it's going to be, it, it's a leveling down. Uh, mm-hmm. that's, you, you, you've probably seen that, uh, that, that, that cartoon on uh, the go on social media where there's uh, equality, where the, the, there are three kids standing at a, 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 a fence to watching a baseball match, and one of them is uh, too short to to, to see, and uh, uh, so that, that's equality. But in equity, uh, he has a box to stand on. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, uh, the, 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 the way that socialism works, it's, you're much more likely to see that the, the taller kid uh, has, his, um, has, has his legs uh, broken, and so he isn't able to see over the fence either. Uh, that's unfortunately the way that, equ- uh, that equity works. It's much more of a leveling down process than it is uh, a raising up. Yeah, every time I hear about this, I go back to my childhood grammar school math when we learned about the concept of the lowest common denominator, and I fear that's where this brings us. Oh, very much so. In fact, that, uh, the, the, the term lowest common denominator was very common in British politics in the 1970s. Uh-huh. Uh, we'd suffered through 30-odd 30, uh, 30 years of, uh, of, 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 of an avowedly socialist system, uh, and uh, we'd realized that, it, that we were uh, reduced to the lowest common denominator. Uh, whether it be in, in, in education, like we've just been talking about, where uh, uh, classes had to teach to the ability of the, uh, of the least able student rather than challenge the most able, or if you were uh, talking about uh, uh, you know, trying to get a new gas heating system in, involved, uh, installed in your house. You would have to make an appointment and go to the uh, uh, and uh, go to the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the the local gas board. In many ways, it was like um, <laughs> like dealing with, uh, with with a local free clinic. Uh, you know, the the the, the, the uh, installation of new gas systems w- w- was rationed, and you had to wait. And it it, it was uh, a, a dreary and depressing place. And it really. And this is the, 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 the real problem that the, 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 the people notice. It just quashed opportunity and initiative and innovation. And uh, that leads to a very, very stagnant and unpleasant society. Uh, we're talking with Ian Murray. The book is The Socialist Temptation. You know, we've been talking a lot about economics and, and social issues surrounding all of this, but there's a very dark side to all of this, and that is socialism's death toll, which you take on very directly in the book. Well, indeed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the things about uh, socialism is that uh, it, it has had a, a, a horrible tendency uh, to lead to many, many uh, thousands of deaths. Uh, you, if you look at, uh, at the socialist systems that have been put in place around the world, whether it be the Soviet Union or China or uh, Zimbabwe or uh, Venezuela today, one of, the, one of the things they like to do uh, is is to eliminate those property rights that we were talking about earlier, uh, those property rights in land, and so they collectivise uh, land. They collect and thereby they collectivise agriculture. And as a result of this collectivisation of agriculture, because collectivisation of agriculture just does not work and has never been made to work, uh, you end up with uh, starvation. So many uh, many millions died in the Ukraine. Uh, uh, in the Soviet Union in the, uh, a tragedy known as the Holodomor. And many, many more millions died in the Great Leap Forward in, uh, in China. Uh, then, because these internal contradictions of socialism uh, uh, are, are starting to become apparent, and people are dying when they, when they were promised that they would be well-fed, uh, there's a reaction against it. So the socialists realize that they have to maintain their control. And so you end up with a situation like you did in China with the Cultural Revolution, where they are trying to destroy all memory of a better system that was in place uh, beforehand. And they destroy um, c- 
cultural icons and they destroy uh, people's lives uh, in order to maintain this control. And then finally, you get to a situation like you had in Cambodia, where they institutionalize this, uh, this destruction of history by saying that this is year zero. All, uh, all of history before this uh, is uh, irrelevant and must be forgotten. We are starting afresh. And that's when you have the, the, the really systematic killings uh, taking place uh, with uh, hundreds of thousands of people being sent to, uh, uh, being sent to, to re-education camps and ver very few of them actually surviving. So socialism has a very real uh, and apparent death toll that, uh, that we, we forget at our peril. Ian, uh, those precursors that you just referenced, the eradication of historical icons or the actual removal of history from the schools, it's happening now in America. This is frightening. Well, indeed. That's, uh, uh, th 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 this is something that I, I actually did not anticipate happening uh, as quickly when I wrote mm. The Socialist Temptation. If I, if I were writing the book now, uh, there would be a whole chapter on uh, America's cultural revolution today. Uh, it, there, there, there is this uh, belief amongst uh, socialists that, that uh, everything about his, uh, history uh, is, uh, it, it, it is wrong. That they have to say to people that uh, everything you've learned about your past is a lie. So they eliminate uh, the, 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 all the myths and traditions and legends uh, uh, and stories that, that, that we tell uh, that we tell our children about uh, our history uh, as uh, as lies and fiction and uh, or, or worse uh, uh, covering up um, uh, what, what, the, what they would call uh, you know, s systemic racism or exploitation. But if you're going to do that, then you have then in the end you can't you can't just stop at the symbols. You can't just stop at the statues. You can't just stop at the history books. You have to turn around and eliminate the oral tradition. And that's when you start targeting, uh, uh, t targeting people who are, uh, who, who are telling, uh, telling these stories. And in the end, you have, uh, you have to get rid of the seekers after truth. You have to get rid of the intellectuals. And that's what got, uh, led Cambodia to the absurd situation whereby they were killing anybody with, who wore spectacles on the grounds that they might be intellectual. There are so many lessons to learn. We've talked about property rights. You've referenced free speech. I also want to go to the uh, First Amendment and talk about religion and whether or not uh, religion and socialism can coexist in an honest way. Well, the thing about religion is that... Uh, uh, Religion and churches and uh, the sort of spontaneous uh, uh, associations that we see springing up as a result of religion, uh, they provide um, public, uh, public goods, social goods at, at, at low cost uh, to, to people. So in that respect, uh, they are actually uh, a, a direct competitor to government. If you were saying that the only source of fairness and equity and social goods is uh, is the democratically controlled government, then you can't have uh, private competitors uh, to, to, to this provision of, uh, of of social good. If that, uh, that that means that if that social good is being uh, uh, delivered as a result of a conception of religious duty, you can't allow that either. So in the end, socialism and religion are always going to be direct competitors. And there are various, various ways in which socialism has uh, attacked uh, religion in the, in the past. If you look at the Soviet Union, uh, you know, they, they had an, uh, an official policy of, of, of atheism, but uh, they, uh, they, they stepped back from, from, from destroying the church, which, which allowed it to survive, I think, for, because... You know, the, 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 the Russians were very, very religious people and are becoming so again. It seems, though, but, that the, the Chinese are, are currently in the process after allowing some religious freedom, maybe more than many were aware of, are now looking to uh, squash religion in China. Oh, indeed. And it's, uh, 
uh, it, it's interesting that it's, uh, it, it, it's the Muslim faith uh, in China amongst the Uyghurs that is, uh, that, that is the number one target. But uh, you know, the, the Chinese uh, religious and uh, quasi-religious sects like the Falun Gong uh, are also, uh, also targets. If Christianity was bigger in China, it would be a tar- uh, uh, as big a target uh, as them as well. But, but at the moment, uh, it, it's, it's, it's those other faiths uh, that, that are the number one targets. And because we're, uh, uh, we are a predominantly Christian country, I think we're hearing less about, uh, about this. Uh, these attacks on on religions in China than we otherwise would. You spent some time in the book on a very important topic that some people, Ian, don't like to talk about, and that is the infighting in the conservative movement, which has inhibited us in many ways from fighting back. Would you talk about that? Well, indeed. Uh, yes, socialism is uh, an, an, an economic system, and uh, it has always been... Uh, 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 contrasted with the the uh, fundamentally American system of capitalism. Uh, unfortunately, we are now seeing uh, that there, there are some people in the conservative movement uh, who, for reasons that are still unclear to me, uh, are themselves attacking capitalism. In in so doing, they undermine our best response uh, to socialism, which is to say that socialism and, uh, produces terrible results. Uh, capitalism pr- uh, produces much better results. In, it, it gets to the stage when it, where uh, some people in the conservative movement are actually uh, espousing socialist uh, economic policies, even though they don't call them socialist. Uh, so industrial policy, for instance, uh, uh, which is very popular in some uh, s- uh, some aspects of the conservative movement at the moment, is essentially a form of regulated central planning of of, of, of the economy. Yes, it's not as bad as full uh, as full socialism, but it's it it it's, uh, it shares very many of the uh, of the same characteristics, and it's always failed whenever it's been tried. Ian Murray, I'd like to talk, and you you have a very brief portion of the book afterward, just talking about COVID. And, uh, and how this has impacted American capitalism and really our, our system fundamentally. I know you didn't have a lot of time to expound on that, but would you give us a few words? Well, yes, I, I, th- I think that there, there are uh, two things that, uh, that uh, COVID has done to us. One, I think, is that because of the, uh, the, the, the very nature of the, of, of the disease and the, the, uh, the belief amongst the majority of the American people that we have to, uh, have to uh, keep separate from, uh, from each other, that's, that is going to suppress economic activity. So it is going to make, uh, lead to much bigger demands for, uh, for, for, for a more expansive welfare state. Uh, we're, we're certainly already seeing this in the, the, the current negotiations over the next phase of, 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 of the relief bill. One silver lining, I think, is that um, that, that, that COVID has uh, revealed that there are a lot of regulations in place, uh, that micromanaging di- direction of the economy that I talked about earlier, uh, that, uh, that, that, that were nev- obviously never needed in the first place. And so a lot of states and, uh, and uh, municipalities uh, particularly have got rid of uh, of a lot of regulation. We're seeing uh, the federal government reduce regulations on telemedicine and other things. So I think if we can capture that moment and push forward and say uh, this shows that regulation is uh, it, it, is, um, it, is is a real drain and a barrier on on necessary economic activity, then they, we might be able to push back against the uh, socialist belief that that. Uh, uh, that the economy needs to be uh, regulated uh, to the ninth degree. Uh, that is one of the few silver linings I see at the moment. Finally, Ian Murray, you have put it wonderfully when you uh, have a chapter on free stuff versus free people. And I think that conservatives in general have, for whatever reason, uh, been outpaced in the marketing of free stuff versus free people. The younger generation seems uh, seduced by getting everything free. So how do we change that? Well, we we just have to uh, have to uh, stand up for, uh, for for freedom itself as a fundamental American value. That's the the free people part of it. We we actually have to uh, to to speak at the uh, at, at the fundamental value level of of, of freedom and, and make people realize that our free enterprise system is much more conducive to a free people than, uh, than socialism is. And on the other hand. 
I think we can learn from what happened in in, in Britain uh, at uh, at the last uh, the last general election over there, where the uh, the, the Socialist Labour Party came out with uh, with this manifesto that was just full of free stuff. Uh, the, the Conservative Party over there just pointed out the absurdity of it all and how it's, uh, and how you cannot possibly provide all this stuff for free. Uh, so we need to heighten the contradiction that uh, that, uh, that, 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 that socialism uh, says it will provide all of this free stuff, but it doesn't say how it's going to pay for it. Ian Murray, how can people get a copy or more information on the socialist temptation? Uh, you can get a copy of The Socialist Temptation at, currently at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any of the good online book, uh, booksellers. Uh, I believe it's coming into stores slowly, uh, so you can check out your local bookstore, and you can go to uh, socialisttemptation.com. Ian Murray, you've done a wonderful job in explaining the problem and proposing solutions. Thank you so much for joining us today on The Shilling Show Unleashed. An absolute pleasure. Thank you. That concludes another edition of the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Visit us online at shillingshow.com where you can directly support this podcast by clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page and making a monthly donation. Your support is essential for the continuation of the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Until next time.